Um, right, so our next guest speakers are uh, Lauren Gatto and his doctoral student, Chris Vanderop. Um, Lauren is a major contributor and a proponent of open source science and is a developer of um, several widely used computational biology and proteomic analysis packages, such as uh, MSN Base. Um, and because both are really passionate about um, open source and reproducible science, um, especially in proteomics, they've developed uh, an R bioconductor package uh, called Q Features uh, to streamline proteomic data analysis. And more recently, they developed a package called SCP to specifically um, analyze single cell proteomic data uh, in a way that's clear, standardized, and uh, can be reproduced by several different labs that use it. Uh, and in fact, in creating this SCP package, they've replicated the data analysis that was published in Scope 2. Um, which was really important for this nascent field of uh, single cell proteomics. And so now I would like to hand it over to uh, Chris and Lauren so that we can learn more about their software. Thank you very much. Could you just confirm that you can hear me? Yep, everything good. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so um, our presentation for today is composed of uh, four parts. I'll start with a general introduction about uh, what is SCP, and then I'll be talking about the Q features package that was just mentioned, and then Christoph will take over uh, and talk about um, importing single cell proteomics data into R, and then data process. Uh, but before starting, I'd like to, to thank uh, the organizers uh, for the invitation to give us the opportunity to, to present our work and um, allow uh, us to present remotely and, and follow all the really great talks remotely. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to, to join you for this conference. So thank you very much uh, to organize this kind of hybrid approach to conferencing. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity for people that, that can't travel. Um, so all the sl uh, slides are available. So here's a link where you can follow um, along uh, and, and watch them and follow slides later on. And then we have also uh, for each part uh, prepared a little survey, a little question <clears throat> that uh, you can answer interactively. And so here's the link uh, to the different questions. And, and these links will um, come up a couple of times during, during the talks. So currently, this is how, uh, this is how the, the, the questions look like, but they, they will appear in a minute. So <clears throat> let me get started with um, what is um, SCP? So <clears throat> SCP stands for Single Cell Proteomics. Uh, and it's a piece of software to process, analyze, and interpret uh, mass spectrometry-based single-cell proteomic state. So it's an R package. It's implemented in the R language for computing, and is operated through the R environment. And one important point is that it's part by a conductor, so it's interoperable. It can work with other software, uh, benefits from this kind of very rich uh, bioconductor toolkit to analyze various types of omics data, including uh, proteomics data and single cell transcriptomics. Uh, but before carrying on, there is a, a quick survey, uh, and we'll I'll briefly mention the, the results at the end of the talk. So I would like you to describe your familiarity with R and, and bioconductor in general. And so I have kind of four, five levels of familiarity from you know, what is he talking about to uh, your kind of frequent R bioconductor uh, user. And you can answer these questions following the, the link here. Okay, <clears throat> but so uh, in the meantime, how can you get started with uh, SCP? So there are multiple ways to get started. Uh, we have a little preprint out that um, describes the uh, reproduction of the uh, scope data set, where we describe the results, we describe some underlying um, properties of the data, but we have also a web page that I'm going to uh, briefly show here that comes with ample documentation. So there is a get started document here. Uh, we have a couple of uh, more, more targeted uh, manual pages uh, called vignettes, and then all the functions that are part of the software are, are documented and, and can uh, are now readily available. And I'll talk a little bit later about an online tutorial um, that we have also prepared. So plenty of information if we want to get started. Now, is uh, SCP like, you know, insert your favorite software here? And I would say no, uh, SCP, the point of S um, SCP is to give you maximal flexibility. Um, so it's really meant to 
uh, provide functionality dedicated to most parameter-based single cell proteomics or quantitative in general, but specifically single cell proteomics and flexibility and reproducibility here are key. So are there any other alternatives to SCP? Well, to the best of my knowledge, the closest uh, that there is, is a Python-based uh, software, Scepter, published by Irving School um, earlier this year. And um, I might be a little bit biased here, although I, I have read uh, uh, that paper and the software in detail, um, I would say that um, SCP has some slightly more advanced, uh, advanced functionalities. But uh, if, if there is interest in using both software, uh, they could, uh, it would be quite easy to, to make them uh, kind of cross talk, even though that one is in R and the other one uh, is in Python. So one question that you might have is, do we need dedicated single cell data analysis software? Uh, I would say yes, um, single cell, uh, proteomics suffers from the same uh, issues that we have in bulk, um, uh, proteomics, uh, batch effects, missing values, but they are kind of amplified here and they very much interact. And we, we describe this um, in, in the preprint. And given that we have different types of data now, we will want to ask different types of questions. And again, here is um, where bi Bioconductor shines because we have a a dedicated downstream analysis pipeline readily available that interacts very nicely with, with SCP. I also want to highlight that by the time we start to work with more complex data, uh, clinical data from patients, for example, um, the need for the flexibility and kind of the fine tuning, the statistical parameters of our models uh, will become absolutely crucial. Now, hopefully I'll uh, have convinced you that um, SCP is worth a try. How would you install it? It's uh, quite easy. You copy and paste these three commands that will ins install the SCP package, plus all its dependencies, plus SCP data that will provide you already with um, a dozen or so uh, published single cell proteomics data sets uh, for you to play with. And later on, uh, Christoph will show you how to load your own data into R. Can you test it without installing it? Yes, absolutely. If you follow this link, and I'll briefly show it here, uh, you'll be redirected um, first. Um, sorry. Um, you, you'll re be redirected to a, um, a, a page with a link to this list of workshops. And so if you search for SCP, um, so here you have all the details of that workshop. Uh, we will tackle, we'll discuss a few uh, items of these workshops today, but we don't have time to, to see everything. And then there is the, the link uh, here at the bottom. And all these instructions, I'm going very quickly over these instructions now, but they're all det detailed here. Um, you can then open and launch here a kind of a, a cloud instance running R um, and R Studio with all the software pre installed. And then you just type your username and password R Studio, um, and you will have your um, R Studio cloud instance ready for you to. Uh, to play with. Let me just quickly show you Studio. Um, and here you go, don't need to, to start. And so you will have your RStudio instance and you'll be able to, uh, to play around with, with Q features with FCP and, and preloaded da data without having to install it. <clears throat> now a question that I very often get, uh, do I need to know R? Obviously, yes, you will have to know R. Um, but do you need to be a programmer, statistician, bioinformatician, or whatever? Absolutely not. Uh, what you need to do is to be keen to analyze and understand your data um, um, as much as you want. So where can you get help? Um, uh, there is a support site, a bioconductor support site. So SCP Q features are bioconductor packages. So feel free to ask your questions there. Uh, you can ask specifically questions about SCP on the SCP web page on GitHub. And we also uh, want run uh, workshops. So if you're interested, please get in touch um, and we can see you to have to get you some hands-on experience. And next step, try it out, please, locally or in the cloud. Have a look at the documentation. We have uh, made lots of effort to, to, for it to be um, um, as helpful as possible. And of course, feel free to ask questions. And so 
Um, we have um, 60 or so people that have replied to the question. I'm very happy to say that nobody said, what is he talking about? So that's very good. We have about 30% that have heard about R and Bioconductor but never used it. 23% uh, that have used R and Bioconductor in the past, 41% that use it frequently, and 8% that don't have R Bioconductor experience but are familiar with other scripting languages such as Python. Excellent. Um, so I have a second set of slides here. Um, and these slides will talk about the handling of this quantitative proteomics data. Um, and it explains the infrastructure that um, underlies SCP and the analysis of single cell proteomics data, which is Q features. So Q features is again an R bioconductor package um, that can be used to process and manage quantitative proteomics data. And that package provides a container for your quantitative data. And that container will track and record all the processing steps that you do. And one of the important processing steps, and these are those that I will uh, demonstrate or highlight today, and they are more, are uh, feature aggregation. So you're all very familiar that we measure um, kind of lower level features, for instance, PSMs, and these need to be aggregated into proteins and, oh, sorry, into peptides and peptides and cells need to be aggregated into uh, proteins or protein groups, right? And we need to take these quantitative values and combine them or aggregate them to get uh, the protein level values that we're interested in. Well, QFeature does this in a consistent and reproducible way and records, um, records all these steps so that you'll be able to easily track your features across these different levels. So let's have a, a little look um, under the hood and understand what QFeatures does and how it does it. So <clears throat> this box here represents a QFeatures object. And the Q features object contain, contains several items. And those that you see here on the left are assays, and they are called PSM1, PSM2. And these assays contain quantitative data. For features along the rows, in this case, PSMs, they're called PSM because they contain PSM level data, and samples along the columns. And in addition, in addition to that, Q features also contain sample annotation, sample metadata, also called call data, that contains the annotation the, um, of all the samples and the matching of all the samples in your assays. So here I have an example with three assays, but you could have hundreds of assays or a single assay. And later on, um, Christoph will describe how to create these objects. Now, let's dig a little bit, little, uh, little bit deeper, sorry, into assays. What do they contain? Well, they can look like tables uh, where we have quantitative data. In this case, I only display two samples that I call S1 and S2. And in this hypothetical example, I have 10 rows. Okay, so I have these 20 quantitative values, but I also have metadata. So for example, I know that my three first PSMs are mapped to a match to this sequence, the three next ones are matched to this, this sequence, and these six PSMs matching two peptides map to protein A, and so on. So each of these assays contains all this information for, for example, a TMT acquisitions. And here's an example of the sample annotation. So in this little example, uh, I have 36 samples. Okay, S1, S2, S3, and these map to the respective columns in the assays. And this is really important. Um, this is very important information because with this information, we can, for example, uh, kind of search through our data and, and extract the columns across different assays for example, for example, cell type. A. Okay, so this is what we have in these Q features um, objects, assays, and sample annotation. So let's have a look at the kind of things that um, we might want to do with this specific assay, uh, Q features objects with three assays. Well, the first one would be to aggregate these PSM assays into peptide assays, okay? Uh, and we can use a, a function called aggregate features over assays. We give it, so the Q features object is Q, called QF, and we tell it, I want to take P assays PSM1, 2, 3, 
I will want to aggregate them into three new assays, PAP1, PAP2, PAP3. And I want to do this using the media. And this is exactly what the software will be doing. And it will remember these links between assays, as well as the relationship between the rows in one assay and the rows in the other assay. Second operation, well, what we want to do now is to join PAP1, PAP2, PAP3 into one large table uh, where we have all our samples aligned next to each other. Of course, aligning the rows as necessary. And we can call join assays where we say, I want to join PAP1, PAP2, PAP3 and create a new assay called peptides that you can see here. Um, and carry on with this uh, example here, I might want now to aggregate my peptides into proteins. And this is something I can do with the aggregate features. I tell my function that I want to start with the peptides assay. I want to create a new one that I call proteins. Oh, and here I'm missing an S called proteins. Um, again, here I, I refer to these uh, row annotations and I want to do this again using the call meetings. And everything here, now, now at the end, I start with a few features of object with three, three assays. Now I have one with eight assays and all the relationship between these assays are stored. Now, why is tracking um, important? Well, <clears throat> with these Q features assays, I can very easily say, well, I'm interested in two proteins, step one and step three, that are highlighted here along the rows. And Q features will automatically track starting here from protein information and track back the quantitative values um, across the different levels. And so for example, here in this example, that one has been identified by a single peptide and we had a single PSM supporting that peptide. For step three, in this case, we had 10 peptides and 11 PSMs. So this kind of data manipulation uh, becomes um, straightforward. Now I have uh, discussed about aggregation, but um, there are lots of uh, other, lots of other functionality available in QFeatures and SCP. Quality control that was already uh, discussed, very important. Um, filtering features um, or samples. Transformation and normalization, for example, with a normalizer, uh, the log transform function that takes an assay and then logs transforms its quantitative values. Imputation, batch correction, visualization, and then, as I mentioned, we have the kind of the full um, statistical toolkit available um, in R and Bioconductor. So I have a little exercise for you. Um, and the little exercise um, is um, a mapping exercise where here at the top, you have three example figures, um, right? So where we start here with, again, our three assays, PEP1, PEP2, PEP3, and then this, um, in this example, the PAP123 link into a peptides assay, that peptides assay links inside a proteins assay, and then we have a log protein assay. In the other cases, we, ha we have PAP1 that links into log PAP1, the three log PAPs um, merge into a log peptides assay that then links into a log protein assay. And here we have the other extreme where we process the peptide assays individually, uh, peptides into proteins, and then log proteins, and then they all link into a combined assay for all the log proteins. So this is kind of visually how the three pipelines um, are represented. And here we have three uh, sets of commands, um, joining, aggregating, log transforming, aggregating over features, uh, log transforming, joining assays, log transforming, joining, and aggregating. And so there is, uh, for each of these three sets of commands here, one match. And if you now have a look at, the, at this link, you will be able uh, to kind of make it a, a choice and the order uh, will probably be different here between one graphical representation of the pipeline and then the corresponding code. <clears throat> so um, I'll now um, leave the floor to, to Christophe. Um, and if you do the exercises um, on your own um, later on, um, I'll, I'll leave you a little bit more time for more people to, to answer the questions. Um, you will get the, 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 the right answer that will um, show up on screen. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I think Christoph should be online too. Indeed I am. <laughs>
So you can see my screen, right? Um, yeah, yes. Well, okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, in, in this presentation, um, wait, give me a second. Um, so yeah, in this presentation, uh, you will learn how to convert uh, uh, data tables into a Q features object. So Q features object that Laurent just presented. And so that can be used for uh, further data processing as, as Laurent also uh, just shown. Uh, so the slides are, uh, it's the third deck of slides available at this, at this link. Um, yeah. Um, so the slides are available, uh, are, are free to share in the CC BY license. But uh, so the focus point today is uh, answering the question, how can I convert my single cell proteomics data to a Q features object? Well, simple answer, you can do that thanks to the read SCP function. So this function combines an, an input table and a sample table into a ready to process Q feature object. So let me explain what those two tables uh, correspond to. So the input table is typically a table that is uh, generated by a pre-processing software, such as MaxQuant or Proteome Discoverer. Uh, the input table usually contains three types of, of columns. Uh, first, some columns hold the feature annotation. So you may think about uh, the peptide sequence, the charge of the analyzed ion, uh, protein name, and, and so on. You can also have uh, a few columns that hold the quantification data, which is probably the most interesting data. The number of columns may vary depending on the technology you use or on the pre-processing software. And the last type of column contains uh, data associated to the mass uh, spectrometry acquisition. So for instance, uh, we could think about storing the name of the file where the instrument has stored the data. Let's have a look at some um, example data. So <clears throat> here you can see the first, the first few columns contain the annotation. Oh, wait, sorry. The first few columns contain the annotation. Um, so here, the peptide sequence, length of the peptide, charge, and so on. Um, and then you have a few columns that contain the quantitative data. You, you know it because the entries are numeric, which corresponds to the signal intensity. And you know it also because by design, the uh, column, and, and in this example, the columns are called, are starting by report dot intensity dot, and then followed by a number. And then we can see here we have up to 16 quantification columns. The last column is the raw.file is the uh, uh, name of the acquisition run. So that's for the input uh, table, but then you have also the sample table. So, so the sample table is a table that is uh, generated by the, uh, by the researcher. Um, where each line corresponds to a, a single sample, just like Laurent uh, showed you for the Q feature subject. So with read SCP, there are two columns that are really required. So the first column tells the software what are the names of, of the columns that contain the quantification data in the input table. The other column contains the acquisition names, just like we saw for the input table. So beside those two required columns, you can include any, any sample data you, you may have. So be it experimental metadata, sample preparation information, uh, sample types, or all the data collected, uh, collected during the sample preparation. These data are very valuable when it comes to data modeling. So in the example, um, you can see the first two columns are the required column. So this one is very similar to the last column from the input table. You have here uh, uh, the second column. You may notice that they contain the names of the quantification. So remember, starting with report.intensity followed by a number. And then the others are just example data you could have uh, from, for sample annotation. So now you may ask yourself, well, what is, ex what's, what is uh, read SCP exactly doing? Well, read SCP prepares the data in four main steps. First, it takes the input table and separates the feature annotation from the quantitative data. The two tables are then converted to a single cell experiment object. So single cell experiment is a specialized bioconductor data container that creates an interface to existing function and that facilitates analysis, analysis, analysis of 
single cell data. The second step is, uh, is to further split the data, but this time the split is along the rows, so based on the uh, acquisition run. So now because the acquisition are separated, each quantitative data now corresponds to a single and unique sample. In step three, the sample table comes in. So the sample annotations are linked to the quantification data, and this is performed based on the two columns uh, required that I just mentioned. So first, the acquisition names are matched between the uh, input table and the sample table. And next, the quantitative column names from the sample table, sample table are used to retrieve the quantitative column from the input data. Combining the uh, acquisition run names and the quantitative column names allows to create unique sample IDs that are stored with the sample annotation. The final step is to wrap all those databases into a queue features object. So overall, the queue features format enables seamless data management and access that are important for downstream data processing and visualization. So now let me show you how to use read SCP in practice. So consider the two uh, data tables here that are actually very similar to the ones I just showed previously. So you may notice that both tables contain raw that's the raw that's file column, which contains the acquisition names, and that there is the channel column that links, so that contains the names of the quantitative data in the input table. You can convert those two tables to a queue features object using a read SCP by running the command that I show here. So the read SCP takes the two tables and you need to, to tell the function, okay, which column should it use to, do, to perform the, the matching between the acquisition runs. In this case, it is the uh, raw.file column. Finally, you, you also need to tell, okay, in which column in the sample table uh, are the quantification columns, and remember this, it was in the channel column. So running this creates a queue features object and below you can see it's the output. So indeed we have a queue features. It, it tells you that you have a queue features object and here it contains four assays. Four assays because there were four acquisition runs in the data. Each assay is a single cell experiment object, remember so that we can interface with single cell data, uh, single cell methods with a various number of rows here corresponding to quantified PSMs and 16 columns uh, because multiplexing with 16 labels was uh, used to acquire the data. Now maybe just as a mention, uh, you can also import data from a single acquisition or import uh, data that has been already uh, processed. So suppose you acquire data from a single acquisition, you may not want to bother with splitting your data using the read SCP function, but rather use the simple function read Q features as shown here. Also, if you have already processed your data or if you download the data that is ready to analyze, you may simply want to load it as a single cell experiment object and perform downstream analysis. And I will come to that uh, in the next uh, slide deck. So in both cases, the function simply requires the input table, just like for read SCP. Um, and you need to tell manually which are the, uh, the, quantify, the, quantif yeah, the, the columns holding the quantification data. And remember the, the columns starting with report dot intensity followed by a number. Uh, you can add also sample, the sample table as sample annotation, but this is optional. So I hope with this uh, very small and brief presentation uh, that it helps you to understand how to get your single cell uh, proteomics data into R for data processing and analysis using our software. And uh, to test your, your understanding, I, I suggest a little exercise. It's like, um, just, just like Laurent, if you didn't click on the, on the link yet, it's available in the, in the chat. But here is, here is the exercise. So um, given the input and the sample tables, what command creates the single cell proteomics, uh, yeah, creates a single cell proteomics Q feature object. So you have the choice between four commands. Um, and yeah, I'll leave you think about it. <laughs> Thank you. 
So um, if you're looking for, for more details, uh, yeah, I don't know if, okay. If you're looking for more details, uh, we, so Laurent showed the SCP website uh, with all the available documentation. Well, we, we created a dedicated vignette uh, for reading as a single cell proteomics data. Um, Laurent, I don't know, do you want, sh shall we already discuss the, the solution or sh should we let, let them think about it, about the... Maybe we can discuss the solutions at the end if we have time. Okay, let's, let's do that, let's do that. So let me switch to another presentation. Um, oops. Okay, so... So in this presentation, and this is the last uh, slide deck, um, we will discuss about uh, data processing and I will show you how to perform two important steps. So quality, con quality control at feature level and quality control at sample level. Uh, I will also briefly mention and demonstrate how to perform uh, dimension reduction as an example of downstream analysis. As as the four slide decks, uh, it's still the same link and they are also uh, available on the CC BY license. So a burning question you might have uh, once you acquired your single cell proteomics data is how should I process uh, my data? Well, answering this question is not trivial. Uh, so further research is required to provide uh, principled guidelines about single cell uh, proteomics data processing but we can already rely on existing processing software. And for, I show here, for instance, an example where um, this is the workflow uh, from the Scope 2 seminal paper published by uh, Nikolai's lab. So there are many different steps and steps that are shown in yellow are steps that are commonly applied also to bulk proteomics and are therefore available from the QFeatures package. However, some, some steps are uh, specific to single, to single cell data and the functions to perform them are, are, are available in the SCP package. And yeah, due, due to time constraint, I won't cover all steps, but you can find the full reproduction of uh, the workflow in our replication vignette. And there is also a discussion uh, of this workflow in our uh, preprint. So if you have, um, if you have access to the, to the slides, you can see, um, well, the preprint is clickable and the replication vignette is clickable so you can Get direct access to the sources. Okay, let's first start with one of the steps and let me show you how to perform a, a PSM quality control. So the objective of PSM quality control is to identify and remove low quality PSMs in order to improve the reliability of the downstream analysis results. Um, so I will use a, a, an example of quality control and it is the sample to carry ratio, which is the signal from samples divided by the signal from carriers. So carriers can contain tens to hundreds of cell equivalents. And so the logic is when a PSM that exhibits a high ratio, so meaning that the signal in samples becomes close to the signal in carriers or even exceeds it, well, then this means that an issue has occurred during the acquisition and or the quantification steps. And this needs to be removed. Um, I will show you an example um, distribution of the signal to carrier ratio. So you can see here, most ratios are close to 1% uh, as expected by experimental design. But you may have noticed that there is also a trail here, which with where the ratios are much higher. Those, in, those indicate that an issue uh, has occurred here and we want to get rid of uh, those, those features, those PSMs with high ratios. So let's quickly see how to do that. Here is the code. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> my bad. Um, yeah, so sorry, so here's the code. Um, so yeah, if you want to get more details or more understanding on what, what the code exactly does, I would suggest you to read the vignette. That's, there will be, I think it's, it's kind of comprehensively explained. But here quickly, we use the compute SCR to compute uh, single sample to carrier ratios um, on some Q features data. So scope two data is Q feature object. We, we tell the function uh, what the sample, uh, what the samples are and what the carrier are. 
and we store the results directly back to the queue features under the SCR as a feature annotation. The second chunk will, uh, will create the plot I just showed. Um, first, what we need to do is to retrieve the feature annotation. So this is done with this line of code. And then the output, we, we supply it to ggplot. So ggplot are functions to create a visualization in R. Uh, so running this will create the histogram I just showed. Finally, uh, once we have looked at the data and uh, looked at the plot and say, okay, define what we want to keep, making sure everything is okay. Well, what we can do is we can filter the PSM. We can remove the PSMs that, were, that had a, a signal to carry that is too high. We do this using the filter features function on the queue feature. It will automatically uh, uh, get the uh, feature annotation. And we say we want to keep only uh, uh, PSMs that are below, uh, that have an, uh, a ratio below 10%. Okay, no, so now, similarly to what we just saw, I will also demonstrate how to perform quality control on single cell samples. So the objective of single cell quality control is to identify and remove low quality cells in order to improve the re reliability of downstream analysis results, actually just like what I said for feature quality control. So again, I will use an example, and in this case it's uh, using the median coefficient of variation. So the coefficient of variation measures the robustness of quantification of four protein in a sample. If we take the median across a single cell, well, uh, then we can get an estimate of the robustness of quantification within that single cell. So single cells with a high median, of, uh, high median coefficient of variation indicate issues during acquisition and we need to remove those samples. Let me show again the plot. Um, so th this is the distribution of the median coefficient of variation that, that I computed uh, for all single cells in an example data set. So by including the blanks, blanks should theoretically contain a mostly noise signal. While this helps defining a, a threshold where a single cell are considered too noisy. Here you can see that the threshold is at 0.5 so that we can exclude all blanks. But at the same time, we also exclude a few uh, single cell with, that are uh, tagged as low quality. Um, again, <laughs> let me show you the code to perform this. Um, so um, the first chunk will compute the median coefficient of variation. And this is done using the median CV per cell function. And this we will take a Q feature object. You can also supply various arguments to control how the coefficients are computed. And those are directly stored in the Q features object as sample annotation. The second chunk uh, very similarly to, uh, to for the features, we also uh, plot the distribution. So here we extract the sample annotation using call data. Um, and we provide the results to uh, ggplot, which will again create the histogram I just showed you. Finally, the last chunk applies the filtering. So subset by call data means that we take a subset of the samples based on sample annotation. So here we select all samples um, that have a median coefficient of variation below 0.5. So that's the threshold uh, we just defined in, on, based on the histogram. And this is basically how you can perform two uh, yeah, quality control steps on the features or on the single cells. Um, again, if you want to have a, a comprehens comprehensive demonstration, well, uh, you can find it in the replication vignette. So now you may still ask yourself, okay, <laughs> what can I do after the data processing? So once your data is processed, um, you are actually ready to perform downstream analysis. And that's, actually, that's also where the fun begins. So common downstream analysis are, for instance, uh, dimension reduction, cluster analysis, uh, cluster annotation, differential protein abundance analysis, and, and many more, of course. Um, most of the methods to perform single cell analysis are actually already available. And so we can directly apply those methods to our data because we decided to store, uh, because our data is contained in single cell experiment objects within the Q features object. Um, and as an example, again, let me demonstrate how to apply dimension reduction using the skater package uh, available from uh, Bioconductor. 
So here is the uh, TSNE plots, one of the one kind of dimensional reduction, uh, and that we generated from an example uh, data for protein data. Um, and this data, I, I obtained it by aggregating the PSNs to protein without further processing. And so you can see on this plot that um, the main source of variability is the acquisition batch. And this is often not desirable. So a thorough data processing is critical if you want to do principal data analysis and in order to generate robust biological knowledge. If we do not correctly model the data, well, we may pass through interesting information or focus on confounding effects. Um, now here I, again, show you the code. Um, uh, yeah, so first what we do is we extract our data of interest from the Q fetus object. In this case, we extract the proteins because we want protein data. And we use the get with call data, which will be, uh, transfer the sample annotation to our extracted object. Uh, next, we compute the TSNE after a little imputation of missing values by zero. So this is performed by this line. Um, and we so this and this computes the TSNE. And, and note that run TSNE is a function from the skater package. So not from SCP, but from another package that we can directly interface with. Um, finally, we generate the plot. So this will, will create the plot and we color it by the acquisition set, uh, saying here. Again, plot TSNE is not from SCP, it's from the skater package. So I hope this presentation could help you understand how to perform uh, some data processing using our software and namely quality control and what you could do with your data after processing. Um, let's Let's again uh, check your understanding with a very small exercise. Um, so here, given the uh, distribution of the median coefficient of variation per cell, so here for 1,000 cells, what command would you use to remove low quality cells? And so I have here six different commands, and they differ by either the threshold and by saying, do you want above, do you want to keep uh, uh, the samples above or below the threshold? So again, I will, we will let you uh, think a little bit about it. Um, and yeah, I, will, I can show you uh, already the next slide. I, I hope you all have <laughs> this clicked on the survey. If not, it's also available in the chat. Um, but what, yeah, if you want some uh, further information, uh, I'll suggest you again <laughs> to check our replication vignette. Uh, the, the reference are clickable. So you, if you have the slides, you can immediately click on it. Um, we also have a preprint uh, that discusses the results of this replication. Again, you can click on it. And you can also have access to the workshop if you want to have your, your, end, your hands on uh, the software. And this is the same workshop that Laurent uh, mentioned. Okay, I thank you already all for your attention. Um, and I think I'll, I'll pass the, the mic to, uh, to Laurent for, for the survey. Thank you very much. Um, I'll wait a little bit more time for people to finish um, answering the last exercise. But otherwise, I can already tell you that for the first exercise, so in my second slide deck, we had 76% of correct answers. Uh, and I didn't write down how many people uh, replied to the question, uh, but maybe we can check that later together. And, um, you will be able to see the correct, um, the correct answers once I mark, uh, I click on the button. Uh, maybe we can do that for this question. So let me check what do you see. So the correct answer was choosing the, the cells with median CV smaller than 0.32. And here we have 58%. Uh, of correct answers. Let me check. I think if I go back uh, and I go back here. Uh, so for the previous question, uh, we had 70% um, of people that chose the correct uh, code chunk to read a single cell progeny state. So I think you should be able to, to see the results on um, following the link. If not, feel free to. <laughs> to send us a little message 
Um, and we can, of course, provide the, the answers later on. Um, so I, I replied uh, to a couple of questions um, in the chat, but I see here that there is a, another one. Uh, why do you choose to impute your data by zero? Uh, so, Laurent, I think oh. you should let the moderator help. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, go ahead. No problem at all. Um, I'll get to the, uh, I think it's going to be a good idea to talk about some of the questions that were asked in the chat so that other people um, who are watch this video in the future might be able to benefit from that as well. Um, but first, is there anybody in the audience that has a question for um, Laurent or Chris? Yeah. Um, what is it? Uh, normally, CVs are computed within replicates of sale, but you're a CV computed on a per cell basis. How is that done? Is that done on the basis of peptides? Um, so, this, oh, I'm sorry. Um, for a CV, normally you would have a group and you would calculate a CV for a protein or whatever. However, in this case, it you had CVs per cell. How do you calculate a CV on a per cell basis? Is that on a basis of peptides? Yeah, so I went a bit quickly uh, over it, um, but indeed it's per group. So what we do is we group with uh, per, so for each, within each cell, we group per protein. So we have different peptides uh, and then we compute one CV per, per protein. But since there are many proteins per cell, we have many CVs per cells. And that's why we take the median of the CV. So we get, it's, it's a rough estimate of what's the general coefficient of variation across that cell. I hope. Based on peptides? Uh, but it's based on peptides? Yeah, so it's based on, it's peptide data grouped by protein, indeed. And yeah, for, for, to give a little bit more detail, maybe you saw it, but we also restrict, we compute CVs only if we have at least six uh, peptides. But I mean, with, with our functions, you can, it's an, an argument, so you can change this if you want to, to base it on more peptides you can, or if you think less is good, uh, that's possible too. Um, yeah, and then some questions um, from the audience in the chat. Um, the first of which is, do you recommend any level of normalization for the reporter ion um, intensity values prior to loading them into the input table? Um, I, I gave already a first part of the question, maybe um, so fun to follow up. Um, so personally, when I start my analysis, I would prefer to load non-normalized data. So that has been, hasn't been processed by, by any other software uh, to be able to visualize and, and explore the data myself and then make kind of informed decision as how to process it. Um, but yes, normalization will indeed be re required. Um, but I prefer to, to do that normalization step myself um, to first explore the data. And uh, another question that was asked that you very nicely answered was, uh, can you analyze bulk samples with this function, with these functions as well? <clears throat> yes, so the idea behind Q features is to be general and it can be, it can handle bulk um, proteomics data or single cell proteomics data. And the documentation Q features describes the use case using bulk um, a proteomics data. SCP adds another level of functionality on top of a Q features, and SCP is specialized for single cell a proteomics data. So everything that is single cell specific is in, in SCP, but everything that is more general and that is applicable to bulk um, proteomics, did I say single cell RNA sequencing if I did? Sorry. Um, but so everything that is generic for bulk. Um, oh, sorry, generic for, for proteomics in general, that's in Q features, yes. Um, and then another question is about um, how would you potentially control for PSM quality if you don't have a carrier? Um, so the, the um, examples that, that we provided there were um, kind of following the scope two pipeline. So indeed there we have a carrier. Um, so I guess it will very much depend on your experimental design, but I would certainly start by 
comparing the distributions um, of my different samples. Um, because in, in an ideal world, you would expect these distributions to be as similar as possible and then verify uh, whether these uh, deviations that you have in your, in your quantitative features don't follow any other uh, cofactors or any batch effects. That's certainly a, a first type of um, QC I would do. Um, I don't know, I think I... I uh... Yeah, that, that, all, that all makes sense. Um, the, the process would probably change a little bit uh, for that, yeah. Um... Uh, oh yeah, another good question is how, uh, could you comment on how you would set the CV threshold? Um, so like, I think in your example, you used a threshold of 0.5. Is that something that the user should look at every time they do an experiment and then set that themselves? Yeah, I would say, in, well, I mean, you, you could make something automated, um, but in, in this case, I, well, I define the, the CV threshold based on, based on blanks, basically saying, okay, so blanks we know is supposed to be noise signal and we consider them as, let's say, a null distribution of what would be like uh, a bad sample. Um, you could, of course, write some, some, some additional code to automatically detect uh, this threshold if you have blanks. Uh, of course, if you don't have blanks, well, things start to get a bit more difficult because then how can you define the, the threshold? Um, what sometimes happens, and I mean, this is an example from uh, single cell RNA sec, although they don't have CVs but, uh, or coefficients of variations, they, they usually, usually do this on other metrics. But you can see um, what's the general, what's the general uh, distribution of the population and do you see some outliers that uh, sort of some cells, I mean, cells that would have failed, but well, they would get out of the general distribution. Um, you can define your, your, your CV based on that. Again, yeah. you can develop some automated way to, to define thresholds, but my, my personal experience or more the way I, I like to do it is, is to go and, and check the data to make sure that, okay, things seem reasonable and, and sometimes you might have another reason like or the, 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 the software might get confused if you have automatic thresholds. So. So my advice would be like, like look at the data and define the thresholds yourself. Right. Um, so there was a question about uh, imputation. Um, uh, I don't thoroughly understand the question, but maybe you will. Um, the question was, why would you choose to impute yeah. your data by zero? Uh, okay, yeah, I think I understand. And it's actually a good remark because like imputation by zero is probably one of the worst <laughs> way of imputing data. Uh, I did it for two reasons. First of all, because I thought like the code would be easy to read because methods equal zero, like would be easy to understand it's zero imputation. The other reason is because, um, well, this is in some, some way what is done for signal cell RNA-seq. So, I mean, I like to have those parallels with, with other fields. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would definitely not advise to use imputation by zero. Uh, I think there's still a lot of work to do about how best impute data for single cell proteomics. I mean, there's already a lot of work done uh, on, on pr just proteomics data. And now we'll see, can this also be translated to single cell proteomics data uh, is still to be confirmed. And I think, yeah, to be, um, this will, of course, uh, influence like differential expression afterwards. And, and, and probably like you see on the TSNI, I've shown you can see those three batches that were clearly separated, and probably because they are different quantitative data, but I'm also pretty sure because like the missingness were different. I mean, all different uh, feet of the essence peptides or proteins were missing in, in, in this data. Yeah, but definitely I would, I would not recommend to do a zero imputation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, another question was inquiring about what might be the difference um, between some of your packages and another one called uh, MS Stat. Um, yeah, I think MS Stats, um, although it has evolved a lot um, recently, but the kind of first focus was um, statistical analysis of these peptides, you know, linear, linear models, and, and taking into account the structure among, among the features. Um, um, it also probably uh, provides functionality to kind of to process the data, maybe to impute your data in a certain way. 
but the kind of the main focus was at least statistics. In this case, that that's not not the first goal of, of Q features. It will um, allow you to construct um, more complex uh, processing pipelines, and I, I showed a couple in, in, in the little figures in the in the exercise. Um, and then, if you would want to apply statistical models, you would use other software. You could use MSStat, MSQROP, um, Lima, depending on your um, on your actual question to choose the, the statistical models that that, that fit, fit most. And then again, if you have single cell proteomics data, you would um, use SCP for, for the single cell specific question. So even though there is, uh, of course, always overlap among these packages, and that's good, we, we, we need diversity. There is never a single tool that fills all questions. Um, I think the original questions were, or the original goals were quite different. Uh, and maybe you do similar, um, have kind of sim similar goals in mind, but, but they do it um, somehow differently or different approaches. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, it's great to have this diversity and then different people using the, the, the tools that, that suit them most based on their question. Great. Uh, another question is, can SCP be integrated with single cell RNA-seq analysis? Um, yes, actually, that's a very good question. And that's one of the reasons why um, we, we like to work with bioconductor infrastructure is that this single cell experiment a class that Christoph mentioned is exactly the same that you would use if you were to analyze single cell RNA sequencing data. And so you can kind of, um, and this facilitate integration, integration of these different data sets. Um, so the exact answer to that question will depend on the details, but it makes the kind of multi-omics or the cross-omics analysis much easier because you learn tool, the tools once and you can then apply them to your different omics modalities. Uh, fantastic, okay. Um, I think that's about it for the questions. Um, that was a great presentation and um, your talks always reflect how good of a teacher you are. And so, um, yeah, great talk.